Hey folks, I'm here and I'm gonna show you how I do my beat sprites. And uh, I guess it's a little different than how most people do them. Um, I don't really know how to describe it without just showing you, so I'm gonna do that. Um, all this junk that I got here on the table uh, is the stuff that I use in my process. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of point out what they are, if they're not obvious. I'm gonna point them out anyway, and if you hear noises, it's my dog in the background. So I apologize for that. Um, first off, pegboard. I use a super pegboard instead of the interlocking ones. I actually have the interlocking ones over here. So you can see how much bigger they actually are in comparison to the super pegboard. So this one comes, when you buy it, it has a parrot on the background. Just if you want to find it, it's got like price tag of $15 or so. Um, it's really handy. It's the only one I use. I use the little ones when I have sprites that are like that big to do. But that's it. Um, yeah, then I use tweezers because I find it absolutely impossible to use my hands. And you need tape for the method that I use. It's the taping method or adapted version of the taping method. Um, and I use, if I can show you, Painter's Mate, which directions I go, I'm looking at it in reverse. Painter's Mate tape. Uh, it's green, obviously. Yeah. It's, I guess, less sticky than masking tape, but it holds just, like, enough to not ruin your sprites. Um, you're gonna need an iron, which should be obvious. You're gonna need ironing paper, obviously probably a bigger piece than that, but that fits nicely on my desk, so I use that. Or you could use parchment paper, from what I understand. Um, I've used it once to try and fix something. I didn't really like it, I just keep using the ironing paper. Mostly because my grandmother bought me like five packages of it from Florida when she was down there. Um, I need gloves uh, for my method kind of thing. That'll look, I'll explain that later when we get to it. You need something heavy, which is a two liter bottle of water for me. Um, two solid pieces of some sort of material. For me, I use two glass cutting boards. You can kind of see them here. Yeah, or it. There's only one of them. And uh, two ice packs, or enough ice pack, ice coverage, or whatever, to cover your solid piece of material or a glass cutting board in my example, um, and a rag or a towel of some sort. And it'll all make more sense when I get to that point. So I'm going to um, make this example with, or this tutorial, sorry, with uh, Majora's Mask. Um, I'll put the image on the screen somewhere there, I'm assuming. Um, and I will also put a link in the description to the pattern, or the image I used to make my pattern. Um, I just basically reworked someone's uh, previously existing sprite. So, credit to them, because <laughs> I didn't come up with the pattern. And, yeah, so I'm going to beat it, and I'm going to speed through it so it doesn't take three hours to show you. Um, it's going to be done in two parts, so one will probably cover the majority of this pegboard, and then the other part of it is just a small sliver. And I'm going to show you how I connect my large sprites, because I know a lot of people who use the interlocking pegboards um, can do it all at once, but I prefer to be able to flip my uh, project. Uh, so I guess uh, you're also going to need something else solid, and for that I use a, just a chunk of cardboard um, that I got with my square register thing. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to just start beating, and I will explain the process as I go. So enjoy! So now that we have it all beaded, voila, uh, we're going to take our tape, lovely painters made green tape, um, and we're going to tape the project. Um, it's a pretty standard thing for the tape method, um, only with this way, um, instead of doing it on an interlocking pegboard like I mentioned before, and making it a full um, design, 
it's missing a part, as you may be able to see here. Uh, so when you're taping it, you want to make sure any side that is going to connect to another side has a smooth edge of tape. So basically we're going to start there. So I'm going to set that down and I'm going to rotate this carefully. The next thing you want to do is bump it and send beads flying. And then we're going to take our tape. Uh, I also, I was mentioning, I uh, use the two inch tape. Uh, they have smaller widths. Um, but I like the two inch because it takes up more coverage, or covers more. Anyways, um, so now take your tape and very carefully line it up with the edge. Uh, yeah, I was gonna use a smaller piece, but I think this will be fine. And make sure the beads are kind of half exposed, but not really. And tape it down carefully. You don't want to lift the tape, because if you lift the tape, it pulls the beads up and the beads don't like to, like go back down easily. Or nicely, I should say. It's easy enough to fix, but it's not nice. Okay, I'm going to try and zoom in on this, and hopefully I won't look like a monkey operating the camera. Wrong direction, of course. So you can kind of, that's as far back as I can go, see that the beads are a little bit poking out. That's so you can line them up with the next piece. I'm just going to kind of gently press down on the edge so the beads don't go flying, but to make sure that they all stick. Back out. Oh, they don't know how to drive this thing, apparently. Okay. So now that you've got your first bit of bead, or tape, and I'm just going to push the corners down so they're not peeling up. And you want to tape the rest of it. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And instead of making you watch that for five minutes while I fight with the tape, probably going to zip through it again, too. Bad example, I just knocked a bead out of place. So you just pick it up, kind of peel the tape back ever so slightly, and place it back in place. And you want to make sure the entire section with the beads, like all your placed beads, is covered completely. You don't want loose beads. So if you cut up or you rip off a piece of tape too short, just another piece and stick it on top. Okay, so now that you have the entire thing taped, um, I forgot to mention that you want to make sure that everything is overlapping a little bit so that the tape like sticks to itself. Um, now that you have the, everything covered in tape, you want to push down on all the beads to make sure that it uh, sticks to the tape really well. Um, I'm going to turn it back the way that it was originally. And um, I just use my thumb and push down with a little bit of pressure, not too much, that you send the beads flying up or under the tape, but enough that you can kind of hear a creak of the tape sticking. Uh, I'll try and see if I can pick it up with the microphone, um, but no guarantees on that. So maybe. <laughs> just want to go over the entire thing. I'll stop talking in a second so you can hear. You just want to go over everything, the edges and all that, and make sure That all the beads are stuck down. There it is. See? Ah. Be exceptionally careful on the edge here because you don't want beads flying around everywhere. That's pretty stuck. Oh, there we go. And um, 
Now this is where I kind of differ from the standard tape method. method. Uh, I know a lot of people um, are probably going to disagree with me here. Um, most people would say you always, always have to puncture holes in each individual bead. Again, you probably can't really see what I'm pointing to with the tweezers because um, the thing's too far away, but each bead, you in the standard tape method, you want to poke a hole in. But I find, I th at least I, my opinion, maybe not opinion, but my thoughts are that this painter's mate tape isn't as thick or something as masking tape is, which is what most people use for the taping method. Um, so I think it breathes a little better or something, but uh, the main reason that you want to poke holes in your project um, in each individual bead, so like all 2,000 of them or whatever this project calls for, I think it's 2,000 and something, um, is to let air flow through so your beads don't pucker up and distort when they're being ironed. Um, I've never had that problem. Uh, I was officially, <laughs> initially a lazy when I first started the tape method um, following other people's instructions and thought, yeah, I'll try it without doing the holes. And it, it's worked for me, but no guarantees <laughs> that your project is going to turn out as good as mine do, um, or as well as mine do, maybe not as good, but um, so if you want to sit there and poke holes in them, it's recommended, but I don't. Anyways, um, I just wanted to kind of throw that in there. Uh, so now that we've got this side covered and taped, um, we're going to want to work on the next half of it, the little section that goes over here. Um, so I'm going to bead that up next and then tape it. And then we'll move over to my dining room table and I'll show you the next step. So yeah, let's get to it. Okay, so now we have our two pieces, which I'll turn this way, taped together, and you can kind of see the pattern through the tape, and we need to get them off the pegboards. So that's where your flipping device is in handy. I was using a cutting board, um, just a flimsy plastic thing, but I have this fantastic chunk of cardboard, which is what I'm using now. So anything flat and sturdy, like a foam board, a bristol board, anything like that should work. Maybe not bristol board, bristol board might be a little flippy, or floppy, whatever. Um, but something sturdy uh, you can use to put on the other side of the pegboard. Uh, even another pegboard, for example, if you weren't using it, you could probably use that too. Uh, maybe the flat side. Or the, yeah. Anyways, uh, I'm just going to move one of these pieces out of the way. We'll do the small one second. And you just put it on top, pick up the pegboard, and flip. Voila. Easy as pie. Uh, you want to make sure the tape does not stick to the pegboard when you pull it off. So, just gently lift, and it didn't, which is great. So we have one side now. And you just kind of slide it off. And out of the way. And if they're small enough, like this piece, you could probably just use your hand by putting it on top of it and flipping. But I'm going to use the cardboard just because I don't want to mess this up right now. <laughs> yeah. That's the cardboard. Flip. Place. And spin that. And that one didn't stick either, which is good. And this And now you have your two halves of your one piece. Where is it? Goes like that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now to connect them, you just take your tape again, pull off a piece that's long enough as the, the to cover the connecting piece. Move the little one out of the way. We'll go with the big one here. It's easier. Place it down on the table. 
And then what I do is I just stick my thumbs to the tape so it lifts ever so slightly and place it on top of the other piece of tape. And be careful when you take your thumbs off because the tape sticks. Because that's what tape does. Yeah. And then kind of push that down so it sticks to that one. Because remember those beads are hanging off the edge, right? Right. So then I'm gonna get my head in the shot on this one, so I apologize if I do. Um, you wanna line it up as best as you can. And what I find works um, best, I guess, is like as long as you know where it's going. Um, I, I remember from, if you have to look at your image, go for it, obviously. Um, I try to kind of overlap them so that they're standing up. I don't know if you can see that. Let me let it look. Not really. Okay, sorry. Um, well, it's kind of not lying flat because you're going to have to push it in to place. Oop. Because if you push it into place lightly, it kind of lines up a little better than if you just set it beside it. So you're basically just trying to line this up as best as you can. Don't push down until you're 100% sure that that's where you want it to be. Because the goal is to make it seamless, which is why you don't iron it into sections or whatever else you may do, I don't know. I think that's pretty good. And then just mush it down. That looks pretty good. Okay. Now that you have it all as one piece, this is where the gloves come in handy. Again, uh, most people would like put a book on top of it or something to um, let it cool. But I'm impatient and apparently lazy because I don't poke holes. But uh, yeah, poke holes before you iron. If you are going to poke holes, poke holes before you flip. But um, yeah, so gloves. Yeah, I'm gonna put on the gloves because um, I manhandle it as you go. Like as I'm ironing, I'm touching it and moving it around and it gets hot because you're ironing it. So yeah, the gloves are really handy. I have a story about these gloves, but that will make the video like six hours long, so I'm not gonna tell you about it. Um, my iron's already preheating, or heated, I guess. It's been on for a couple minutes. So I'm gonna go ahead and iron this. And I'm gonna kind of talk while I do it. Sorry, I'm gonna turn it sideways here. Um, so, let's see if my iron's gonna reach that. Other. Okay. So when I'm ironing, sorry about my dog making a heck of a lot of noise right now. Uh, he's playing with himself. Yeah, uh, so I start on one side and kind of heat the whole thing by moving in circles first. Then when the wa uh, ironing paper is stuck to the actual um, art, I will turn it around so that not everything gets the exact same side of the iron, right? Because you're going to get one side of the iron all this way if you're only going one way, or holding the iron in one way. Like you could spin the iron, but it's easier to spin the piece of rope. So I'm gonna start ironing now. And the other thing that I definitely do differently is I lift the paper. Um, from what I've seen a lot of, like in videos of people ironing, they don't lift the paper until it's completely cooled. But because I'm not completely cooling it, I um, I lift the paper so I can see what I'm doing. But I'll get to that when it's all stuck. Okay, so I'm about ready to lift the paper just to have a look and see what needs more attention. So when you do, instead of just ripping it back or peeling it back slowly. What I do is I use the iron. I'm going to try and show this as best as I can. I place the iron in the spot closest to where I'm lifting and press down and pull up at the same time. So that it comes off clean and it doesn't leave very many much seams. So I don't know if you can see very well. 
The middle definitely needs some more work, so does the end. And it's also already starting to curl. So let's get to work again. Okay, and so I'm gonna lift the paper again. So you just place the iron, just a little bit of pressure, enough to keep the paper from sliding out from underneath it, and pull it back. So I need a little more work down here, down the edge, and along the edge of the eye in the middle still, for sure. Okay, so I'm just going to bring this up to you guys, so you can see, not really any puckering, which is good, and I think it's the painter's tape. Anyways, so now it's relatively solid, well it's got the tape on it, so you just want to flip it over, and you can see it's curling from the heat. Um, my iron might be turning off in a minute, so I'm going to have to go sh plug that back in. Um, but now you want to take the tape off, and I'm going to just take my glove off of one hand because it sticks really badly to this glove. So just carefully peel back your tape. You try not to yank it off because you might pull loose a bead or two. If you do, maybe if I'm lucky I'll get one loose and I can show you how to fix it, uh, but if not, you just take the tape on the other side that you already ironed and tape the bead back in the position that it was. And then iron this side normally, flip it over, take the tape off, and then iron that side again. I'm gonna bug my dog with it. And as you can see, we now have one solid piece. And unless you knew exactly where the line was, you really can't see it. <laughs> Which is why I like this way. Instead of separating the pieces and ironing them and then ironing them together. But now you just iron this side. Just like you would iron the other side. Hopefully my iron will stay on long enough. And I do the exact same thing. This side usually irons a lot faster because it's already heated up. And this is also your front side. Uh, unless it's something like this, which has no front and no back. Um, if it's something with lettering or something in a specific position, then uh, this would be the front. Now, or the way that the lettering would run correctly. Okay, so now that I've got it about 98% done ironing on this side, I will usually flip it over and do a quick one or two once over on the other side before putting it into my little cooling station. And unfortunately, I should have taken a, a little snippet of a video of that before I started ironing because this needs to get into it immediately and I do not have time to adjust the, the uh, tripod. I'm going to stop ironing this side because I stopped paying attention to talk to my dog and now I've over ironed it a bit. And carefully flip it back over. You can see it's kind of floppy and it's probably going to stick to the table because it's still really warm. But this way it kind of counteracts the curl that it's trying to do. And now we're going to move it over to the cooling station. So I'm going to put this into it and then move my tripod and hopefully show you what it looks like and how the ice packs work with the um, glass cutting board. Okay. Okay, so this is the little cooling station kind of thing I've got going on. Um, conveniently, the Majora's Mask fits in between the two cutting boards. Um, it's about time I flip it though. 
Uh, so what I've got, so two liter bottle of water here um, for weight to keep it flat. Then it's sandwiched between a glass cutting board. I'm gonna try real hard not to hit the tripod here. Um, another glass cutting board, and there's two ice packs underneath. So what the ice packs do is they they basically just suck the hot heat, hot heat, out of the ironed piece. Um, so when you're doing that, I don't know if you can see the curve, kind of. It curves it towards the cool. Yeah. So now the top side that I'm showing you now is curving up. So we want to flip it over so that it's now on the bottom. And then I sandwich it again. Put the bottle on top. Okay folks, so now you can see that we have our completed Majora's Mask. And it's uh, pretty good, I think. <laughs> Uh, as you can see here, I don't do a full melt. I leave it so you can still see the bead holes. And I didn't get any of the puckering or any distorted beads um, that you would get normally, I guess, if you don't poke holes. And like I said before, I think that's the Painter's Mate tape. Um, being just painter's tape, maybe not specifically painter's mate, but as opposed to masking tape which holds a lot stronger. Uh, so I would recommend giving that a try if you do the tape method. Um, not necessarily doing it my way, I just find this way is the easiest way to actually do it. Because I like to flip my project instead of trying to peel it off. Um, hopefully if you find this useful you can let me know or Pass it along to somebody else. Have a good night, guys. Toodles.